a bit less personal there. And with this, I'd like to welcome you all. And I would like to thank you for arriving at such an early hour um, and to listen to us talk about housing in Europe. Thank you for being here. This forum is part of a three-part series, all of which deal with housing, the problems with housing in Europe. Yesterday, we had our first workshop with the speakers who are with us here on the podium today. We will be talking about the situation of living, of accommodation everywhere in Europe, and we will talk about the different movements that work in housing and who discuss the ongoing problems. We are trying to give you an overview of the current situation in Europe. Eva is here as a representative of the European Network for Housing, and she will she has supplied us with a few examples from the parts of Europe that aren't represented here today. What we learned yesterday was that there are similar problems everywhere in Europe. What could be the common eco economical root of all these problems? Where do they all stem from? And what can we do to meet those challenges? What could we do to change the system to meet those challenges? That will be the topic we're focusing on today. And tomorrow, to change from this academic standpoint, but sorry, not tomorrow, but this afternoon at 4.30, we will have another workshop. In this workshop, we'll be talking about the strategic perspectives there are about the perspectives for the different movements in Europe. And we'll also talk about how they can support each other to increase the effect, all of which dealing with housing. And all of which with the idea to, to finally achieve a change in the system. I'll introduce the podium. I myself am Michael Telman. I'm here together Oh, I was supposed to be here with Dr. Werner Heinz, who has sadly fallen in and ill, and I'd like to excuse him from all of you today. But to my left, I've already introduced her. We have Eva Bitavazzi from the European Network for Housing. On my right-hand side, I have David Mzara from the PAH, PAH from Madrid. On the very right, we have Marie from Paris, from Droit au Logement, the right to housing, accommodation. On the right-hand side, we have Lena, Lena from Madrid too. And she too, part of the accommodation movement, and next to her, Laura. Next to Laura, we have Ingrid Hoffmann. She is from Berlin, from housing movement there. And next to myself, we have Philipp Metzger from Berlin, who works in economics and housing. He will start today's discussion. But before we start, there's something else I'd like to talk about. I wanted you to know that we will focus on these topics, on economics, on alternatives for the systems, and what can politics do? We'll focus on these aspects. We will have a first round of discussions with two leading questions for all of you. Then we'll talk about them and afterwards we'll have a second moment where you can talk about questions with the speakers on the podium. In the third round we'll have questions from the audience, but I would already ask you to pick up a piece of paper and just write down the questions if you have any. As we have so many speakers and so much input and so many people present, we do not have much time for many questions. I would like to start into the discussion here with all the speakers present. 
just give me a moment. I already touched upon this. There are the same topics and problems everywhere. Those phenomena, expulsion, an increase in rent, privatization of housing, and it, concentration of people owning flats. These are phenomena that are present everywhere, not just in Europe, but everywhere in the world. The housing movements in Europe, as well as in South America, in the United States and in Asia. Today, we will focus on the European part. This leads us to another question. Are we dealing with an economic, econ economical problem here? Is there a global system behind these problems? And what is the system behind these problems? Which is why I would like to start with Philip Metzger. Philip, what are the interests and the groups that are behind the housing problems in the metropolis? The metropolis. I'll start with the similarities and I'll try to say what the problem is and where it comes from. After the Second World War, we had a strong state and high wages, and in the 70s, we had the neoliberalism that started, so the first privatization of housing, a decrease in the force of the social state. We also had a deregulation of the financial market that went together with the financing of several sectors. Fin in the UK and the United States, we have a similar situation when it comes to the housing problems. Those are nations where most people own their own houses and flats. There are very few people who actually rent places. but. Very few of those people actually own their houses. Most of them had to take a credit to pay for it, and they are now in debt. To try and avoid further debt, or to try to pay for things like social security and health, sometimes people had to take out further credits, which brought them further into debt. And now many owners are trying to finance their life and pay back their debt waiting for the house's value to increase and trading shares generally. All of this crashed in the financial crisis in 2015, sorry, 2008. These were the first decades of finance and in housing. There's just one thing to be aware of. This anti-development was a bit different in every country. In Germany, we have fewer people owning houses and more people living renting houses. More than half of the population rent their accommodation. This is a very special case. Most of it comes down to the fact that after the Second World War, we had 23 million people who did not have a place to live. And in Germany, the idea was to strengthen the economy through export, but the country was afraid of not being able to provide enough housing and thus having to change the way they are focusing on their economy. To make sure that everybody could work and do their share, the state and the government started to build many houses and flats. They built millions of flats in the first decades and simultaneously established a frame, legal framework for people who lived for rent. Those apartments were given to people, they were accorded to them, and this was, this has entered a crisis in the 1970s in Germany. The government stopped interfering with social housing, and this has led to a decrease in social housing. Social housing has a problem in Germany anyway, because after 30 years it is privatized. In the 1990s, with Helmut Kohl, the financial market was liberalized. This was even increased and became a stronger problem under a later government. They also intended to privatize housing. 
all of this thinking of the American system where people usually buy their own flats. This would not have been easy to accomplish in Germany because if people live in a social in social accommodation and then say they'll just walk to a bank and ask for credit to buy their own accommodation, usually that just doesn't work. If they just enter and say, please give me money, then usually they wouldn't grant this credit. In the United States that might work, but in Germany it doesn't because the banks have a different policy. And with this, we had a stop for in social housing. This was sold to private equity firms. It was also a historical, well, something that happened by chance. We had the reunion of Germany and overnight there was a huge change in the market, a very profitable one for the finance sector because it is much a much better deal to just be able to buy tens of thousands of apartments in one go instead of just several hundreds. This became a business model that was further encouraged by the government in these times. In the entire sector, big business do not pay taxes until today. Many of them have stopped caring, taking care of the apartments. They have increased the rents and a few years later they usually sold the apartments again in the stock exchange, making huge profit. Or the Deutsche Wohnen, which was a housing program by led by the German bank. This was the second step in the system, selling apartments in the stock exchange. There were laws created in these times and many politicians who ruled under this government afterwards changed and started working in the finance sector. I mentioned this in my books this is, I do not have enough time to mention all of them, but I do intend to make this clear. There was the political intent to have the housing market in Germany relied to the finance sector. They wanted to connect the two. And to come back to today's topic, the fact that Germany is a nation where people live and rent Whereas in Southern Europe, for example, in Spain, we are closer to the American model where people buy houses, they go into debt to buy. We have a difference in models. Thank you, Philip. This is a very good entry into the topic. You mentioned the international financial market in 2008 because somewhere the money has to come from that goes into property and that on the international financial markets the um, where we see modernizing laws so this money can flow between uh, all of those states which then result in international investments um, and then we have institutions like BlackRock that collect money to be able to invest everywhere in Europe. And you said that in Spain it looks a bit different. So now David will start on that and show the view on the interests behind um, the Spanish point of view. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you all. Um, I hope I will make justice to the history in Spain. I will cover a very long period of history, so bear with me. Um, we could say that Spanish home ownership state or, or the view as a country, as a home, home, home ownership country started uh, during Franco's era, and I will explain you why. Um, in the 1950s, Spain had... Okay. Um, Okay, in, in the 1950s, Spain had one of the lowest home ownership um, rates that we, we ever had. 45% of the people owned their homes, whereas 55% of the people were renters. In, in places like Madrid, for instance, 95% of the people were renting their homes. 
So everything shifted from, from Franco's era. Um, he wanted to create a country of homeowners. Um, actually, there's the, one of the first housing ministers, Miguel Arrese, he used to say, we want a country of homeowners, not a country of proletarians. So that was where the, the idea of homeownership was engineered. It has been referred, actually, as Thatcherism avant, avant la lettre, in terms of creating homeowners was a way of creating people who are adept to, adept to the, the, the regime, to, to the dictatorship, and everything started there. And what else can I tell you? Um, obviously, we came from a country we came where we just coming just after the Civil War, where many houses were destroyed, many people were migrating from the countryside to the, um, to the cities. So many people didn't have a home. So many people were arriving to the cities without a place to stay. So uh, in desperation, many people built slack, um, uh, shacks and slums in the outskirts of the cities. So Franco saw this as a problem. So Franco thought, I mean, Franco's regime thought, we need to build homes. We need to build homes. And the idea was building what we call BP, BPOs, which is Viviendas de Protección Oficial, which stands for Officially Protected Housing. Meaning, it's not social housing per se, it's housing which the price will be protected from the market. So the increase in property development in terms of BPO was increasing over the years. And it's true that Franco built an, an awful lot of housing for the masses, but it's also true that this housing many times wasn't given to people who needed the most. So, and I must say that it was always in ownership. You were buying a VPO, always in ownership, on a very low rent first, and then you end up buying it. Um, what Franco saw, that the construction sector had, had an impact, and so it was very good for the country itself, was, um, as, uh, was seen as an economic engine for the country. At the same time, it was building the industry, but the industry wasn't really launching, although in the 50s and in the 60s, the industry was, very well, was doing very well, but... Uh, didn't end up launching because of European pressure, etc. So he thought that, um, as, I, as I'm trying to say, the building sector had its impact. So in the 60s, um, 50s and 60s, Spain also um, started to receive international tourists, as we, all, as we all know. So he understood that in order to receive more tourists, he had to develop an industry, meaning he had to build uh, infrastructure, he had to build hotels, accommodation, etc. So all these things together, seeing the housing industry on one hand and the tourism industry on another, he saw that it had, an, a, it had big potentials. So going back to tourism, tourism was building up and building up, more people were coming, so he saw a, a potential of letting private developers coming into the country and helping them, supporting them to build more and more, uh, not only infrastructure for tourism, but also in, um, housing. And then we arrived to the first, um, first building boom in our area, in our country, that, was, that happened between 1973 and 19, no, sorry, 1970 until 1973, which exploded, and particularly because of the oil crisis, as we, as we all know. And, Things started to, um, obviously we came, we went into democracy in 1975, we had the first elections in 1978, and in the 1980s, the, um, we had the liberalization of the banking sector. So we facilitated, uh, or we eased the conditions of buying homes. So uh, up to that moment, if you wanted to buy a home, uh, it was very difficult, not many banks were giving you a loan or a mortgage. So at that moment, the country itself, I'm, I'm good with time, um, the country itself facilitated the conditions that you could get a loan for up to 80% of the value of, the, of your mortgage. So in 1985, if I'm, no, yes, 1985 and 1992, we had the second building boom. Obviously, again, we had a lot of uh, houses being built all over, all over the country. And one thing is important to point out, that not only in the first, but also in the second, and also later on in the third building boom, the country was building a lot of homes, with a lot of people that were investing in homes, where a lot of people who were investing in a second home, but there were an awful lot of people who didn't have a home. So this is important to, to point out, because we had a country 
that was building more than what we needed, yet there were a lot of people who didn't have a place. In 1975, for instance, FOESA, which is part of Caritas, made um, a report and they found out that there was a million and a half people who didn't have a place to stay. Although we were just coming from a building boom, so which that's important to, to point out. So um, we're going um, forward in history and we arrive at um, the end of the second building boom, uh, a huge crisis, we joined the European Union, there's money coming from the European Union, and in 19, 1997, until 2008, we come into the third building boom, where the country, I mean, the banks um, are receiving money from international banks. Uh, obviously, we, we're building not only more than what we need, but we're building more than any other country in the world. Um, construction levels arrive to a crazy level, and the crisis uh, comes in in 2008, and we realize there's an awful lot of people losing their homes. Uh, Pa had made a report, although we don't have um, um, feasible data because the government doesn't provide the data. And we arrived at the point in which we figured out that there was a million, nearly million, 2,000 people who had lost their homes after the crisis. And in 2012, um, the national government runs an arrangement or runs an agreement with vulture funds who come into con to the country willing to invest in the sector, in the housing sector, because it's an awful lot of houses vacant. The, the, house, the crisis left, we, fi we think, up to three million, three million and a half houses vacant, empty, which were no sold to anyone. So. The, the um, vulture funds were coming into the country, expected to invest. So the, um, the national government ran an agreement with them and, and kind of put in the red carpet to them and offering all kinds of um, all kinds of agreements and all kinds of help in order to invest. And such as, for instance, to, to run a couple of them, um, there was an agreement that rental agreements were dropping from five years minimum to three years. Also, you could evict a tenant if he didn't meet his payments twice. Also, vulture funds were, be, were able to buy an entire building despite of having tenants, and tenants didn't have the choice to buy, for instance, the, the house or the flat if, if it was owned by uh, and wholly by a vulture fund. And, and that's where we, where we are right now. Um, we're, facing, we're still facing a huge crisis. And um, vulture funds are running the show, as we could say. Uh, for instance, um, Black, um, Blackstone owns more than 50,000 50, homes in Spain. The rental market is increasing in places like Madrid, Barcelona, Seville, Valencia. Uh, we haven't seen, we, we only have seen increases in rental prices rather than decreases despite the pandemic and so on and so forth. So I think I will leave it there, and hopefully my, my friends from Madrid will be able to help me out. Yeah, uh, vielen Dank, David. Thank you, David. We can see how history changes and is interconnected with politics and other departments, and we can see what led to this crisis. Before I come back to Germany with Ingrid, I would like to see and hear what the situation in France looked like, how the econo economical forces are. Marie, it's your turn. Okay. Micro, micro. Il, il faut que tu, tu prends le micro. C'est bon Oui, désolé, il y a le décalage avec la traduction. Merci beaucoup pour la traduction. No problem. The situation in, Fran in France concerning housing. We are somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between those different models. Roughly half of the population in France owns their house. 
About 40% of all in France live by rent. And of those renting, I can, could say that half of them live in social accommodation. And here I'd like to focus a bit on social housing in France. Social housing started in France in the 19th century. From early on we had three categories in social housing. There are three different kinds of people living in those social housing. There is public social housing. This was funded by the communes, by the different departments and by the regions. Then we have social housing built by business. Usually companies built these to have housing or provide housing for their own employees and workers. The third category were caritative organizations. Social housing today is something that is in danger. The government doesn't focus on this project anymore. Social housing was funded by the state until a few years ago. There were financial aids from the state to fund those so this social housing. Today the state doesn't fund these projects anymore. There is no direct financing of these accommodations anymore. As I said, we have those three categories of social housing. And the kind of social housing that belongs to companies become more and more important today. This is a kind of social accommodation that was provided and is managed by companies. Social housing in general becomes more and more dependent from the market. In the 60s and 70s this was different. Back then, entire building blocks were sold for more of a symbolic value, a symbolic price. Today, social housing blocks are sold for prices as they are sold in the general housing sector. And social housing that belongs to the regions and departments are even more in danger. There are different laws and regulations and those resulted in making the situation even more complicated. There are no safe rules and regulations. All of which means that there are less and less social housing opportunities. Two million people need social housing and are waiting to be offered accommodation. This is the current situation in France. 2.2 million people waiting and only 410 flats being free and offered to people every year. Furthermore, 2.8 million people live under bad conditions under poor conditions. There is very little social housing and we also see an increase in the rent. This is also true for the private sector. We also see evictions that happen more and more frequently. More and more people being evicted from their apartments. And the health crisis makes the situa situation even more complicated.
We have seen th the numbers of evictions triple in France during this crisis. And speculations only make this situation even harder. The financial support by the government isn't enough. It's not enough to support all the people who live to rent and who rely on this funding. And the... An expensive rent is of an advantage for the state and for the government because they profit from it. The profit from expensive rent is important for the French economy. And those increased rent prices also result in third parties becoming ever more richer and the state profiting from it. This is a very important topic here today because there's a lot of speculation going on. Apartments that are empty today and this, even though the situation is very hard. The government does less and less and at the same time we see that it profits from financial transactions and from the high rents. That is the current situation. Merci, Mary. Das, das, das war sehr interessant. Thank you Mary, that was very interesting. And before I introduce Eva to say a few words about Europe. We come back to the entire question of owning housing, which is something that we all have in common with all our speakers. Which is why I would like to have Ingrid say a few works, a few words on why they focus that much on ownership of apartments in Berlin. Ingrid, how is the Berlin situation? In Berlin, that is something I already spoke about at the workshop yesterday. Berlin is in a very special situation. In Germany, roughly 50% of all people live to rent. In Berlin, there are 85% of all who live by rent. And in Berlin, at the initiative, we mainly work on the different intentions of the parties involved in this. We have the big companies who want to profit, the big companies who own 25% of all apartments. There's a several hundred thousand of apartments that belong to those companies. Here we are focusing on those who own more than 3,000 apartments. Our main enemy is the Deutsche Wohnen, who used to have 115,000 apartments in Berlin. We just have parties that have different interests. Some focus on the yield, the financial yield, and on a people moving away from different parts of town. Parts of town where the companies don't invest anymore because they want to increase the yield for those investing. In some areas, we have several different types of expropriation. There were building blocks there that belonged to the public. This was expropriated once for the first time. 
all those who lived in those flats then received more money, their wages were increased because they had to pay more money for the rent. And then we saw another expropriation that is one that we are working towards here and our initiative is that we want the companies to be expropriated. Why do we talk about expropriation if we actually want all the f flats to belong to an initiative? When our initiative started to work, only we only had a very general idea of what it would mean to make this a public good, whereas everybody knows what we talk about when we talk about expropriation. If, for, some, for an example, someone doesn't want to sell a bit of ground and someone else wants to buy it, then the state can just expropriate the first owner. This is easy because there is a law for this. Which is why we decided to talk about expropriation. We knew that this term would just cause much more attention, would draw more attention. Expropriation will be such an interesting topic for everyone that we can then add something later on that we want to act in accordance with the Article 15 of the general law in Germany, the Constitution. I have put up a few figures here on the blackboard. Figures from the Vanovia in 2020. I hope you can read them. Because in the period from 2010 to 2018, we have seen the situation become even more dire. The overall wage has increased by 230 euros, whereas the rent in new apartments has increased by an average of 440 euros. Vanovia states something in their record that every share is paid retributed with a dividend of one euro sixty nine. Vanovia ha has a number total number of shares of four hundred five hundred seventy five million. The total dividend are nine hundred seventy two million. The more exact figure is written down on the blackboard. But overall, the Venovia owns 415,000 apartments in Germany, which means that every apartment has a dividend of several hundred euros. If we do the calculations now, if we find the amount of dividend, of the amount of money from the rent that goes into the dividend, then, depending on the size, obviously this varies depending on the size of the flat, but in average, we come up with a figure of 194 euros per month that a person paying rent doesn't pay to the person owning the house, but directly to the shareholders. 194 euros going directly into the shareholders. Which is why we want the flats to go back into possession of the state because then we'd have a decrease in the rent by 200 euros 200 euros that people paying rent just wouldn't have to pay anymore so much to berlin thank you eric ingrid thank you ingrid that was very impressive i would like to remind about one billion is going to shareholders this one billion if that was going to public owners and we would be building apartments with that, a lot of problems could be solved with that. And now what's important for us and interesting for us is going to come from Eva, who will give us a view about the um, phenomena that we haven't seen yet in Europe. I hope you are okay because it's a lot of uh, information for a Friday morning, but I see you are following, <laughs> so I'm happy. Um, so I'm from a, a network of organizations uh, from Europe, 
uh, we are like 34 groups uh, acting on the field to uh, against uh, evictions, uh, for helping people find a, um, a house, for uh, uh, trying to diminish the rents. Uh, so this kind of uh, discussions we have uh, this morning is the kind of discussions we have with the, this uh, network uh, of, uh, of groups that come from 20 different countries. So. Sometimes we are confused because we hear about, okay, uh, there is a, a Vonovia or a Deutsche Wohnen and also there is uh, this uh, uh, housing system in Spain and what is the link between all this? Uh, so we gathered in 2013 for the first time. Uh, we noticed that all of us uh, had problems with housing all around Europe and we wanted to understand what are the mechanisms uh, behind it. And this is why uh, we wrote, with the help of uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, this uh, book that you can find online uh, uh, for free, uh, that is the financialization of housing processes. And uh, through this book, we try to, to link all the realities of uh, these uh, different areas of Europe. Why in Spain there are so many evictions? Why in Berlin the rents go so high? Why in Sweden uh, the social housing is also privatized and liberalized? Why in Greece uh, people are also evicted but the mortgage debt was not as tragic as in Spain? So, uh, so where we found a, a common ground, it was uh, when we analyzed the banking system. And we realized how close uh, the housing issue and the bank uh, system issue is, uh, are, actually. How close they are and how much uh, one alimentate the other. Uh, so we tried uh, to, to start our analysis with the, with the history. But, uh, okay, the common ground we came up with was uh, this uh, sub sub prime crisis in the USA that started in 2017, that blow up actually, not started, they blow up, uh, and that became a financial crisis and that affected all of the banking system of Europe also. And uh, what happened is mainly there are some areas in Europe that uh, had to deal with the mortgage debt crisis, Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, Ireland, and some other countries also. Uh, and they were facing eviction or threats of evictions or foreclosures because uh, many mortgages were given to them, uh, to the people, uh, so that they could access housing. Because it was not that people, they were very happy to be owners. Uh, it was that uh, they wanted uh, to have a house. And to have a house, the cheapest way at that time, it was to get a mortgage. Uh, so this is very important to say because uh, in Europe there was this idea uh, during the crisis uh, of, uh, to, that started in 2008 that people were responsible for the housing problems. But what they were responsible for is that uh, they were just living in a country that affordable housing was not existing. Uh, so this, uh, this is the first point, uh, how the banks gave all these mortgages to people uh, in Spain, in, Lis in uh, Portugal, in Greece, in Ireland, in all these countries. How did the banks get so much money? And we asked us ourselves this. And we discovered that many, many money from uh, these banks, the periphery of Europe, came from Central European uh, banks. So, when these banks of the periphery faced a mortgage debt crisis, uh, they could affect the banks in Central Europe too, and affect the whole of the European economy. And this is where the uh, Central European Bank, the European Central Bank, uh, decided to act. And the European Central Bank normally does not have to deal with housing issues but it has to deal with bank problems. And when it comes to mortgage, uh, then 
in a way, in an indirect way, the European Central Bank also influenced uh, housing issues. And how it did, it's by forcing the countries to sell uh, the bad loans, as they called it, it means the loans that the debtors couldn't pay for 90 days, they forced them to sell them to vulture funds. So this is the funds that our friend David uh, told us about. But financialization process is not uh, one way, it has many ways. Uh, and these are the ways of the periphery, we could say, but it's also, uh, we can find financialization processes through, for example, the investment in housing, like in Berlin, where funds are trying to find a way to invest uh, uh, and to uh, find a refuge for their capital. They need a refuge for their capital during crisis, so they invest uh, in land and in housing. Uh, also, it's an investment that is lucrative, of course, uh, because as Ingrid told us, uh, there is a lot of uh, benefits for shareholders. Uh, and then there is another way of financialization. There are many ways, but I will only say these three because uh, after I will uh, speak uh, for 20 minutes. Uh, another way is the securitization. So, uh, I said that there, there are um, some areas in Europe we see common things, periphery, center, but there are also some ex exceptions. One of the exceptions is Belgium. Belgium is not a country of uh, renters, even if it's uh, all uh, around uh, renter countries, but in Belgium we really like private property and uh, also mortgage debt. And he, there, uh, the financialization is, is through the securitization of mortgage debt. What it means is that uh, people like you and me, we take a debt to the bank, and then the bank, uh, it makes a package, and this package, it sells it to funds, and it goes to the financial market. And it makes ben benefits out of it. So these are the three main, but there are a lot more. We'll speak another time about them. Yeah, vielen Dank, vielen Dank. Thank you so much, Eva. I think we've seen very exactly that the question of property and of also credits is there. And another question that Philip has raised was the capital flow. And that can only be done by reselling debt, not just to Belgium, but internationally. Belgian debts can be bought, basically. And that is our round of the economic uh, side. But this economy can only work because the state has offered their property on the market. And that is why I would like to enter the second round now. How far do the possibilities of our governments go that can be positive for renters? Where are our possibilities and where are limits? And what governmental regulations should be in place from your perspective that have been dealing uh, with everything here. And I would like to begin with Philip once more. And then Laura and Lena will follow to be talking about this from a Spanish view. Because there, the movements should be pressuring. I would say that the I would say that the skill that the state could do a lot if they wanted to change things. If there were the political intentions of changing something, then much could be done. Things could be forbidden. Derivatives, for example, could be forbidden. They are something that has been, it's been quite new in Germany and Ingrid already told us how much the Deutsche Wohnen makes, how much money they make. They nearly 
crashed in 2007, even though they're making so much money at the moment. Because they are also a financial company. They invested into the credits of other countries. They invested into the credits and mortgages of Spain and in other countries. And that means that they too were involved in this kind of financing. Private equity funds are another point. Why do these funds exist? The attractive thing of these funds is that they are unregulated. But there is also a reason why many investors, especially rich investors, meet up in private and then decide to fund a, priv a private fund, fund to then work with it in the finance market. Why are these things allowed? If they are a kind of private club of investors, why does the German government then allow them not to pay any taxes in opposition to all the other funds who do have to pay taxes? Something could be done here. Then all those big housing businesses like Vonovia, Deutsche Wohnen and others, they own over a million apartments in Germany. They could be taken away from those companies. Vonovia hasn't really built many apartments. The Deutsche Wohnen hasn't built a single apartment in Berlin in the last 10 years. It was always the state that funded those apartments. All of this was paid for by the people who paid taxes, which is why I don't understand why now the companies should be the ones making profit. All those companies receive so much funding. How can I be told that it's not possible to but to build apartments now, if it was possible after the Second World War, it can be done. We can build apartments. It was done after the Second World War because then it was in the interest of the government. It was interesting for them, economically speaking. Today, they would have to focus on the tenants, which means that we have to build up pressure, exert pressure on the polit polit politics. And this is something that could be done. But then there always comes the question, is this possible? And usually there I like to tell people about the tenant law in the 50s. Back then it wasn't allowed to have an apartment empty. And back then it was the state who decided who would receive housing, who would move in where. That was under Konrad Adenauer and Today, the Christian Union, the CDU, would probably call this a socialist mindset. But to come back to another point, the state is always participating in these things. Because in the end, they too receive from profits from Venovia and other companies. We heard from France that their the state profits from the increased rents and in Germany sometimes the, the state ends up paying the profits for those companies like Venovia. Venovia as a company owning nearly 500,000 apartments, they have other possibilities than a general tiny person speculating. Vonovia usually buys an entire cluster of building blocks. If they decide to buy a part of town, if they decide to then increase the rents, then the overall rent increases. Which also means that in the end, the unemployment benefits also increase. Because, and because of all these connections, in the end, the state is the one paying the companies. And this money then goes back to the people investing in those companies who then receive the profits. The general idea was that the market would improve the situation and the state would save money. What actually happens was that now the state pays the profits to the investors. And when thinking about what the state could do, I think this would be yet another argument towards expropriating those companies. I think it would be an idea to consider breaking down these companies. 
but the financial market is really compli complicated. We don't know where all those companies are. But we can say that we have five big players. BlackRock, then we have the state fund from Norway, the one from Saudi Arabia, from Singapore and the one from Qatar. This is something that is easily noticed. If we don't look at BlackRock, then all of these are state actors. This is something that we see. Neoliberalism is something necessary to the state, apparently. And again, this is, uh, this is somewhere where we could intervene. Those are international actors. But in Germany, we have 250 private equity funds. All of these are actively participate in housing. How can I, as a politician, always say, oh, well, they're international actors? That's just not true. They're all, those 250 private equity funds are based in Germany and they can be regulated by German law. There is a lobby of the private equity industry as well in Germany. Why can they always participate in writing the laws? When we talk about privatizing the highways, that too was an ongoing debate there. There's a lot that the state can do if the state wants to. There are things that can be done on federal level, there are things that can be done on the European level. Thing We have already spoken about the European Central Bank. But yes, that could be done a lot if the intention was there. Thank you, Philip. And I'll yield the floor in a moment, just talking about what the state could do. What do our friends from Spain think about this? Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Eh, primero, es importante entender que el poder que tiene el gobierno español es limitado, teniendo en cuenta que actualmente, en el 2022, no existe una política de vivienda en España. Lo que ha existido de manera implícita es una política inmobiliaria. Vale. Eh, el gobierno tiene un poder limitado debido a que no existe una política de vivienda. Vielen Dank, dass ich jetzt das Wort ergreifen darf. Also man muss erstmal verstehen, dass der Staat wenig uh, Macht hat in diesem Fall. For giving me the floor, something that has to be understood is that the state in 2022 hasn't focused on this general area. The state, as I said, hasn't really acted in this area. Yes. Uh, I'm going to do it in English, but thank you. So during all the process that David told, we've seen that the government has had more solidarity with the lo financial lobby. That is something that also has been explained by my colleagues. And it has had uh, consequences on the low percentage that the Spanish government has over public housing. We are talking about less than 2% of public housing in Spain. So what we think that one of the measures that government must do is increasing that public housing since that could regulate the market. Government has not the power to regulate the market since a lot of the houses nowadays, how David explained, belong to those funds. Also, it is relevant to note that the government has not data about housing since it doesn't have any law. Now it is <laughs> interesting to say that Idealista, that is one platform in which, I don't know if it uh, exists in here in Germany, but it exists around other countries where people search uh, houses for renting, is the only uh, data uh, collection that the government doesn't own because it's a private company. Uh, the government do not have any source from them to understand the housing problem. Also because all the violation of the right of the right to housing uh, that happened after the outbreak of the crisis, the PA, the anti-eviction uh, platform, has also created a proposal of a law that is the law that pretends to enforce the right to housing in Spain and that's going to be explained by Laura. Eh, la propuesta de ley de los movimientos sociales es una legislación del derecho a la vivienda 
eh, con un enfoque de derechos humanos. Hasta ahora en España ha habido políticas del mercado inmobiliario, pero nunca hemos tenido una ley del derecho a la vivienda. Also una, unser Vorschlag ist eine Our proposal is to have a legislation that regulates the right to accommodation to housing. But so far we haven't had any politics when it comes to housing, but that's something that we, that we would want to change. Eh, se construye sobre la base de una, de una doble columna central, una doble columna vertebral, que es eh, constituida por dos conceptos. Uno es el derecho subjetivo a la vivienda, que es el derecho de todo ser humano que, que resida en España por el hecho de, de respirar, de tener un lugar donde vivir, un lugar estable y seguro y definitivo donde vivir. Unser Vorschlag basiert auf zwei Säulen. Our proposal consists of two pillars. This is concept made of two pillars. On the one hand, the subjective right to accommodation, to housing, meaning that everybody who lives in Spain, who breathes in Spain, has the right to housing, which means a stable and safe housing. De tal manera que una vez sea vulnerado, podamos acudir a las instituciones o al juzgado para que sea eh, para denunciarlo y que, y que sea restituido este derecho. We want this law to also have a social function. And once we have managed to enter this legislation, we would like it to be passed on to the, to the institutions. En juego la segunda el segundo elemento de la ley que es la función social de la propiedad privada. Si todos tenemos derecho a una casa, pero ¿dónde están las casas? Das bedeutet, this also means that this law is based on the second pillar, which is that everybody has the right to own housing, meaning everybody has the right to housing, but now the big question is where are the houses that we need? Privada pero está definido con unos límites. Y aquí entra eh, la función social de la vivienda. Las viviendas están construidas para habitar gente. Y, y ese es el límite de la propiedad. Podemos tener viviendas, podemos venderlas, comprarlas, alquilarlas, pero para darles el uso para el que fueron construidas. Y esto está en la Constitución, pero no está en la vida real, porque no se ha desarrollado una ley que lo proteja. We are here working with the Constitution, where it is written that everybody has the right to housing. That is a social function. We can rent out housing, we can sell it, but the main idea of having this housing isn't included in this legislation. In the Congress, no tiene nada de esto, y estos los, son los elementos esenciales que protegerían y garantizarían el derecho a la vivienda. Nosotras eh, incluimos eh, cinco elementos imprescindibles para que una ley sea efectiva. This law is currently at the Congress. This also means that it hasn't been agreed on now. It is not legally, legally valid. But it is all about having this these general thoughts on the right to housing and us trying to make these five basic principles reality. Que la ley contemple los compromisos internacionales en materias de derechos humanos. Das erste wären die The first right and the first law would be human rights. No, una serie de compromisos. El primero sería de objetivos y de resultados. Das zweite The second would be a compromise between the goals that we have and goals that can and should be reached. Por ley, un compromiso de presupuesto, porque una ley de vivienda entendemos que va a ser muy cara. Das bedeutet aber auch, this also means that, third point, we have to work on our budget, work well with it. Un compromiso, una obligación de evaluación y de seguimiento, 
para tener también información, que es la carencia que, que comentaba mi compañera. Das dritte next point is that we now need surveillance on this point. We need to be able to monitor the housing market. Eh, un sistema de control y de penalización para aquellos agentes o act aquellos actores sociales que incumplan con esta ley. The fifth point, last point, is that we need an institution that controls monitors and also implements and admonishes, admonishes if these laws aren't considered. Those are the essential core elements to make this law become valid. Thank you. Dank, Laura. Das ja schon Thank you, Laura. Those are quite concrete ideas. Now I'm very much looking forward because in the first round we already heard that the state is quite an active actor when it comes to housing. What are the opportunities in France? How could the state regulate this market? How could they influence it? Marie. Ouais. Euh, vous me dites si c'est trop rapide. Looking at law, the right to living. In France, we have different laws. And those laws are supposed to protect tenants. Those laws that I want to get into a little more detail on. I would like to explain how these laws were created, and I would like to name three examples. First of all, the right to, to purchasing. That is connected to the law against speculation. After the Second World War, a lot of houses and a lot of homes were vacant. A lot of people lost their homes, actually. There was a law of expropriation that was accepted by the uh, parliament back then. According to this law, the state was able to seize houses that were vacant. And that way, the government was able to ensure having those houses being used. And now the second one. All of that happened after the Second World War in connection to Résistance, the resistance movement back at that time. And secondly, we have a law that takes, that moves around um, eviction of tenants during winter time. And in the winter time, they may not be evicted from their homes. That law has been in place since 1954, which was a very cold winter. Back then, on the radio, we saw a call for a solidarity movement because a lot of families were in forums. The third law is a law, a actually pretty current law. It's about the right to living. Different organizations have engaged for that in 2007. According to this law, you can go to court for your right to living and your right to housing. If you 
have poor living conditions, the government has to deliver accommodation within six months. And I will quote Nicole Ra here. I don't know if you know her. She is a lawyer that who unfortunately passed away pretty currently. She was a great lawyer, but also an activist. I read that. I read that she said, I'm sorry, the interpretation has a few issues currently. So there is a connection between a right to living and the implementation, and that is what social movements are needed for. It's very interesting because of these three laws, only the second one is actually in place right now, the winter law, basically. And it was prolonged for two more weeks. So you cannot be evicted from your apartment for two more weeks. That was a major success. The law of seizing houses is not being used currently. It was used in the past, but we're still fighting for that currently. The law of taking your right to living to court is currently not in place. We're still engaging for this law being in place. We gathered in Paris to protest for this. And we were actually successful with it. Different families that were without any accommodation were able to get accommodation this way. You'd have to engage in having good laws and having them in place and having them being acted on. All of us can fight for ourselves, but also collectively, which we are currently doing, of course. There is the Housing Action Day on the 1st of April. Thank you, Marie. We're seeing from the contributions that there's a question of governmental acting and the protection of the consequences of that system. So how can we now change the system in a more high quality direction? And we'd like to hear from Eva now, who has a broader perspective about what can be required by governments. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, the, uh, on a European level, it's uh, quite uh, different uh, to talk about uh, how uh, governments should act uh, because uh, the perspective we have uh, show many different actors, uh, decisional actors, that are also public actors. I talked uh, before about the Central European Bank. Uh, I can talk also about the European institution in general, because uh, the European Commission, for example, uh, makes a lot of decisions that influence housing, uh, but also indirect, indirectly. Uh, and uh, one of the examples I can uh, give for that is uh, um, after the, the crisis uh, that we lived in from 2008 on, uh, we saw a lot of countries that were submitted to uh, austerity measures. Austerity measures uh, is something that we heard about a lot, and it's uh, as well very much concerned uh, housing. Uh, not only through the process of uh, um, selling uh, bad loans, bad mortgage loans, and, and pushing people to be evicted, uh, or, for, or their houses to be sold to funds, uh, but um, also uh, 
in particular in national laws. For example, in Greece, there was a law uh, for the protection of the primary house. And uh, signing the different austerity measures so they could receive money from the European Union, uh, they agreed as an exchange to change this protection law and uh, the people who couldn't afford to pay back their debt, uh, they could lose their house and also their primary house. So this law was very important. Primary meaning uh, it's not the house of their grandparents, of the house of their village, it's the house where their family lives and they live with their families. So uh, this law was changed not so we see that some countries of the European Union, like Greece, like Cyprus, like Romania, like many other countries that are not Germany or France, uh, they have uh, somehow a, a pressure, pressure from the European institutions, and these pressures influence uh, their local uh, uh, laws. And uh, of course, it's not that uh, I'm saying that uh, Greece, uh, for example, doesn't have any responsibility in the, the erasement of its law, but I'm saying that there are many public actors, many public levels of decisions that uh, affect uh, the right to housing. So what we as a European coalition of movements uh, want to do is, first of all, to put pressure on countries so that uh, they can uh, force as much as possible the laws of protection of housing to be applied everywhere. Uh, for example, Marie uh, told us about uh, the... Très vivernal, I don't know how you say that in, in English. <laughs> Sorry, I, I try to speak English because I think does, you more does, understand. Uh, does, does, um, yeah. Truth, yes, winter truth, thank you. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, this is something that does not exist in many countries and this is something that uh, some of us would like to see in, in other European countries as well. So we try to push for something existing that it exists in other countries too. But what we also try to do is push all together uh, the European institutions and the European governments as a whole uh, to, to be more careful about uh, the right to housing. For example, uh, during the pandemic, we saw that evictions could be stopped and that the banking system would not collapse. So we think, okay, why not stopping evictions? <laughs> In the European, why should we have the threat of dying from a virus? Uh, so that we don't uh, uh, die of lack of home. <laughs> we, we need uh, this, uh, we, we were, okay, we are wondering why this is not happening, why this is not uh, a, a law that was kept. Also, uh, we saw the example of Berlin, and uh, maybe we'll have some more details after, but about uh, how uh, the Berlin people did this beautiful referendum, uh, asking for the expropriate, uh, no, no, it was not the reference, sorry, it was about the rent freeze uh, that was cancelled by the, co the Supreme Court uh, because it limited uh, private property uh, and uh, the landers don't have the right to limit the private property. And we say, okay, if the landers don't have the right and if uh, it must be a national, maybe it could be a European Union uh, aspect to say, private property must be limited if it affects as much uh, the right to housing. Uh, so there are also other measures that could be uh, taken by a European institution like the European Central Bank. It could be also to limit uh, the activities of banks. Because what we said, uh, what I, I tried to say, but also Philip uh, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, it's uh, the, the fact that, uh, okay, financialization have some actors that are uh, responsible for it. And these actors who are responsible for it, they are not uh, uh, invited to pay taxes, but also they are not, uh, they don't have really rules that uh, um, 
that are applied to them. So we would like to ask the European Central Bank to be, and the European institution to be more strict about uh, these uh, funds, about uh, these banks and uh, how uh, uh, they act uh, on our rights uh, to housing. And finally, I want to, to talk about this EU plan, next generation EU that was so, so incredible to receive uh, such big amount of money in such a short notice. Uh, uh, the EU institution decided to give money to all the countries of the European Union so they could uh, relaunch after the tragic uh, uh, economic uh, uh, consequences of the pandemic. And in this uh, next generation EU plan, uh, why don't we have money for social housing that is not privatized <laughs> and why uh, we and we could ask i think we could ask uh, some uh, uh, help from uh, the european institution to uh, make more investments and to push governments to push local authorities to uh, make more investment for uh, social housing Ja, vielen, vielen Dank, Eva. Das war noch mal Thank you, Eva. That was a very important overview. And we have the protection of the tenants. We have seen that they are asking for more social housing to be built. But we've seen something else, a question that many do not dare ask. Because it is important to ask for things at a European level, something that many EU institutions seem to forget. It's important to act socially. And I believe that it is very important to include those re requests into the agenda of the movement. Tenants have to be protected. This is an essential task. But if we do not fight to change the system, if we don't fight to change the regulations, then we will always end up being given a little and promised more. We can change the system, as Eva has shown us. We do have options there when it comes to regulations via the state. And we cannot let the state abandon their tasks. We have to remind them of their responsibilities. Obviously, I'm trying to motivate you to our workshop this afternoon, where we will be talking about the strategies that we could come up with to act on the different levels, national level, regional level and European level. We want to act on all those levels, but for this we need to combine forces. But now I'd like to use the last 15-20 minutes for questions, I would ask you to formulate your question precisely. Please do not introduce your question too long. I know that everybody has had so much input that probably everybody would have a lot to say from their perspective. But if we want to make the best use of the time that we have, then we really have to focus on the question. If you want to ask a question, we ask you to walk up front and pick up a microphone because we would like to have an interpretation of the questions. I will collect the first three questions, then we'll answer them, and then we'll collect the next three questions. Who believes they can break the ice and ask the first question? No, this isn't possible. First, greatest speaker. I have a question for Ms. Hoffman. You mentioned those 194 euros. Sorry. Could you speak slowly, please? Because we have the interpretation. What would you say, how much of those 194 euros is left after investing into renovations that are direly necessary, especially in privately owned housing? How much of this money that is saved would 
handed back to the tenants. First we're collecting the questions, then the answers. I already asked the question yesterday about who owns the earth that we are building on, and constructing on. What was the question? I believe the entire question of housing also has to do with the question of who owns the space that we build on, that we construct on. Uh, I will try to be short, but I, in Norway, in Oslo, we have some of the same problems because it's a lot of people owning their houses, but now uh, it's getting so expensive that people don't afford. And the local government in Oslo have started a new project where the local government buys apartments and houses and rent them out uh, for market price. And But after you have rented them for some time, you will own the house yourself. But when you sell it, you have to sell it back to the local government. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, is this, what do you think about this system? Is this something that can be used in other places than Oslo? Okay. Danke. Ja, wir, wir kommen zur Antwort. Thank you. We'll come to the answers. I think Berlin first. Ingrid, what was the first question was for you? How much money is left for the tenants after renovating? Well, of those 194 euros, obviously nothing would be left because an average, well, if someone pays for a big apartment, then there's even more money there. And if the apartment is small, then it's less. But this money goes straight to the shareholders. This is written somewhere in the small print of the contract. So most of the tenants don't know this. They'd have to read the contract carefully, then add the number of all apartments, look at the share prices, and then they know how much goes to the shareholders. Something you touched upon is how, money, how much money goes into the renovation. But the problem is that usually those companies do not spend any money on renovating. I live in one of those places. The lift has been broken for four weeks. No one cares. In winter, sometimes we go three weeks without a radiator, without heating. They could change this, but then they would have to invest into renovation to change something for the better. But usually they make money by spending as little as possible on the apartments. First of all, they stop investing and at some point, finally, when they can't avoid it, then they renovate and then they try to make the tenants pay for everything they did because if they really renovate, then the tenants have to pay more rent. This is usually a problem for the tenants because if buildings are renovated, then they become luxury apartments. But usually tenants do not want golden door handles, but they want something that they can use. They don't want especially expensive tiles or floor heating. There are many cases in Berlin where tiny courtyards are and then the landlords want to build balconies. And on those balconies you can shake hands with the neighbors because everything is so tight and crammed and tiny. In many cases the companies owning these buildings don't care about making about doing good things for the tenants, but they just want to do something that the shareholders will appreciate. This is their task. They are stock market industry, stock market business. This uh, is now the last question about the ground that we build on. I want to say something about renovation. This is also connected to privatization and about the fi and the finance market we see that all the money that goes into renovation and others have to be paid off the company themselves have to pay back credits it is hard to lower the rent and renovate but it is possible that's something we see in vienna where i come from 70% of all the living and housing space in Vienna belongs to the state. And in Vienna there were decades where the rents weren't increased. 
and still they always modernized and renovated the buildings. That wasn't a problem, it worked. In Vienna we now have a luxury problem. Now they th thought, well, it was time to build things in, B in Vienna. Only to then realize that they build too many apartments in Vienna. They build more than people actually want housing. That is actually quite a luxury problem, I'm aware of this. And the question about the ground. This is the same as in housing. There is speculation going on. There are people in Frankfurt mainly dealing with this. There are investors who buy and who buy ground, but they don't build on it, but they speculate with it. And usually they just buy and they never build on it. There are ideas here that we introduce laws to make people build on this ground. Do not just leave it standing empty. There is the idea to make them build within two years of acquiring the ground or have it expropriated, have them expropriated and the ground taken back. So expropriation isn't just about building flats but also about ground. So we do have levers to apply laws to exert pressure. We could regulate this problem. We could introduce a law and say if you buy ground and you say you will build on it and you don't, then we will expropriate you. This would be an option. Or we make them sell it. Thank you. Yes, I was talking about Vienna. Sorry, the interpreters cannot hear the question. The question, I have to repeat it because it's not audible for everyone. The question was, now this is about Vienna. What does this have to do with the German constitution? That was the question. Okay. I answered to two questions. One was about the cost of renovating buildings and then I was talking and there I was talking about Vienna and about expropriation. And I said that usually it is cheaper when the state runs the apartment blocks. The second answer was to the second question. What about speculation with ground in Germany? And there I referred to the German constitution and I said that we could write laws, draft laws that go against speculation with ground. Thank you. Marie, you wanted to give an answer too? Yes. About the question of ground. We took a closer look at why the prices increased this much and why con why building costs so much now. There are two factors. First, the prices for the ground itself has increased. The ground has become more expensive. And then, though shareholders have increased their profits. This explains why everything has become more expensive. Looking on the ground, or at the ground, we would like it to be communalized, to belong to everyone. In France, the law protecting owners is sacred law. It's not really a law that we can touch at the moment, but we are fighting to change it. The right to housing is something that we're dealing with at the moment. And that is more important to us at the moment. But to come back to the question about ground in general, I don't think we've spoken a lot about this. Every year in Cannes, in the south of France, a huge market takes place. It's a market of people trading with apartments, houses, and so on. It's a market where all the actors from the entire sector of housing come together. 
It's a huge forum where all the legal bodies join as well. All the actors from the sector. All the vultures who make their money in the sector are present. They talk and make deals. They talk about the big projects going on in Europe and everywhere in the world. And at this market, decisions are made. There they decide where in Africa, for example, ground and buildings are sold. We are coming to the end. We'll hear two more questions and two more answers. And then I'll try to sum up for you something that you can take away in case we haven't managed so far. Bonjour, je parlerai en français. Et je voulais... I will be speaking French. What influence does all of the black money that arrives in Spain by, for example, drug dealing, what influence has this money on the market of uh, real estate in Europe? There are visa being handed out to uh, investing parties and to those who are buying houses for the highest price. And especially if the price is even higher than 50,000 euros. First of all, um. My question is, uh, I'm interested in the relationship between housing and the climate crisis and the energy crisis we are in now. So uh, I was just wondering if in Europe there are success stories for uh, people fighting, for example, for insulating their houses or whether there are countries where this is especially difficult and what lessons there are from this. Maybe Eva being the person who kind of represents all of Europe can start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one, one last question. Yeah, I would like just to uh, yeah, say something about our colleagues, our Spanish colleagues, to ask our Spanish colleagues to explain a little bit the role of the, which is an institution, which is called Sareb, because I think it's very interesting, just a few words about that, okay? If it's possible. Okay, vielen, vielen Dank. Um, Thank you so much. We'll begin with... Let's just begin with the last question. Who would like to reply to that from Spain? David, maybe? Maybe Laura could help me a bit. A bit. Laura, okay. okay. Uh, I will try to summarize because it's quite complex. Um, Sareb was created in 2012, um, literally um, because the European Union put pressure on, on the Spanish state, on Spanish banks that many banks had a lot of investment loans, a lot of properties, a lot of um, unpaid debt. And the, Sp the European law said, you need to do something about it. You need, you need to clear this debt and you need, you need to sell those properties. So the Spanish government came with the idea of creating this governmental organism, which was partly uh, funded by investors, being far, the five, well, some of the five main banks in Spain, and partly by um, the Spanish government. I think it was 50, 55% was um, banks, and 45% was the country, I mean the state. And one of the main things that we don't know about the Sareb is that they end up with a lot of property, uh, not only property, but a lot of land, a lot of uh, no housing, but uh, for instance, garages and warehouses all across Spain. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of property, but we, this never has been clarified to us as, as, the, as the Spanish population. Um, so what they did in Sareb was selling those properties that were owned and run by five main banks. They were starting to sell them to vulture funds here and there. Uh, for instance, in Wigan, the state um, fund came in, about many, uh, also a Texas fund came in, and so on and so forth. Um, yet to this day, we don't know how much of that has been sold, 
how much of that has remained. And yet, we got the European government, I mean the European Parliament, coming back to say, even though that, that organism was created partly by a private, private company, so partly by the public organism, the state, yet the whole country needs to pay the debt. So if we could say that part, partly of the debt has been written off from investment, from banks, but now it's the national government who needs to pay for it, although we, got in, we are in a lot of debt. Um, one more note on the Sareb. Sareb was created in 2012, and he had to close his business, if I remember correctly, in 2027. Uh, we don't know how much of that debt, as I said, has been sold. I mean, how much of those properties were sold. And yet we don't know how much has been cleared out, how much needs to be sold back. So there are many answers, there are many questions that have remain having been answers. And I don't know if Laura could say a bit more. No, uh, bueno, la reflexión general es que hemos perdido una buena oportunidad quedarnos con un parque de vivienda público enorme que, que le hemos pagado entre todos los españoles y ahora no tenemos las viviendas y tenemos la deuda. Unfortunately, we've lost the chance to have a lot of public accommodation spaces. We don't have space now, but a lot of debt. Okay, thank you. Um, Eva, du wolltest auf die Frage Eva, you wanted to respond to Joanna's question and also environmental living. So, um, about Golden Visa, it's a very, very big issue uh, in uh, some uh, southern European countries. Uh, uh, I can say that in Cyprus is the worst thing I have ever seen, the Golden Visa problem. Uh, so there is, um, you, you said uh, about uh, people who are not uh, uh, residents of the European Union that can buy uh, property for an amount of money and then get a visa for five or ten years in Europe. This is the golden visa for those who didn't know what it is. Uh, in some countries it's 500,000, in some other countries it's less, it's 250,000. So um, it's very easy for, uh, for example, uh, Israeli investors or Russian investors or Chinese investors uh, to come uh, buy a property in the European Union and then have a visa to uh, stay or work for five and ten years. So in Cyprus uh, it's horrible because um, uh, together with the state, um, uh, some investors that are kind of mafia uh, people, I would say, uh, are uh, building very, very uh, high um, buildings uh, only to sell for golden visa. And some uh, cities like Limassol, which is a southern city, is completely transformed from these buildings. Uh, and not only... So the, the buildings themselves are empty because they are bought only for the visa. Nobody lives in them. And they transform all the area around uh, um, not only by making the prices go up, but also the neighborhood with an empty building is becoming empty itself. So no schools, no shops, no nothing. It's uh, like a dead city, uh, part of of city. Uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, because the buildings are not uh, lived, they are, they are slowly, you know, when a building is uh, doesn't have inhabitants, uh, they are slowly getting. Uh, uh, um, a week, yes. Uh, so all this is very tragic, um, and uh, there is no limitation about this. There is a lot of profit taken from the government, from relatives of the government, from all this uh, system. Uh, so I think Golden Visa is something that uh, generates uh, gentrification, generates exclusion, and is the summum of uh, the merchandisation of housing. So this is what I wanted to say for many, uh, maybe people uh, don't know about this phenomenon and, and thank you for uh, rising it up. So for the climate crisis uh, related to the housing struggles, uh, 
I, I want to say that uh, there are many groups uh, that are fighting uh, on, in housing, uh, but uh, somehow it's not um, uh, possible to exclude this fight from the climate crisis, because there are so many aspects uh, of it that uh, uh, enter inside the uh, housing. So, uh, for example, I, I want to, to share some, uh, some uh, uh, struggles that are uh, taken. Uh, the real estate now is uh, very much uh, green. It's becoming very much green. And uh, this uh, green washing of the real estate sector uh, is something that is uh, denounced by uh, uh, many activists in housing struggles because uh, only the rhetoric of green uh, makes the prices go up, provokes gentrification, and it's absolutely not green. So uh, somehow uh, um, uh, this is one of the aspects that are uh, uh, fought. Uh, then um, uh, all this uh, um, tendency to renovate buildings, uh, which is a very good thing because we need to renovate buildings, but uh, if it's not accompanied by some social measures that limit the rise of prices and limit uh, the social exclusion that it provokes, then uh, it's an anti-social measure and uh, social exclusion and climate justice cannot come to, uh, together. I, I'm sorry, I will, um, I will end in two minutes. Uh, then, I want to say that many fights for uh, climate justice are fights for housing. And I want to, to say that fights for housing are not only in urban areas, they are also in rural areas. The fights against mining activities, against industrialization of landscapes, against uh, uh, the transformation and also the privatization of land is fights for housing. And moreover, and this is where I want to conclude, is that uh, when I, I said before that it's very important to limit private property, it's not only to limit the profits of uh, big funds uh, that uh, take profit, it's also that if we don't put the question of common land and not private owned land, but the land that we all own, this is to say the land, uh, uh, natural land, uh, if we don't put common land in the public debate, we will not find an issue to the climate crisis. We need absolutely to stop this obsession our society has for private ownership and start uh, giving value to common, common ownership. So this is what. Vielen Dank, Eva. Das war ja schon. Thank you so much, Eva. That was almost a closing line because that was definitely like a red line through the whole discussion. All of those conditions and all of those protection laws we're fighting for have a very fundamental question in them, which is property, living and breathing, goes together. And now our living grounds have to be communalized. And we have to protect tenants. We have to protect ourselves. And how can we make a change of the system? How can we connect? and network. Those are questions that we would like to discuss tonight at 4.30 p.m. so we can find solutions to a way out. I know that this discussion doesn't have a comfortable ending because we have so many aspects that need a lot more discussion and earn a lot more discussion, but I hope that the experience our speakers have talked about that they can help you transform your work. And I would like to say two things at the beginning, at the ending. So thank you so much to our speakers that really came all the way here to share their experience and to help us with their knowledge. And I would like to thank 
the interpreting team and the technical assistance that enabled us to be here and to communicate. The interpreting team thanks you as well. And I would like to thank all of you because I've had this large amount of attention and it was really fun to be hosting this round here. And the questions were short and precise and that really helped us. And now, stopping thinking, tomorrow at 10 should look at the at the picture story about gentrification in Spain in Building Z. So that our topic isn't just a theoretical topic, but that also touches upon artistic topics. And if I would like to mention the coming together in Athens, beginning of November, where we can ask ourselves how we can empower ourselves and how we can support ourselves within Europe, where we can discuss about those topics. Thank you so much, and I hope that you have a great lunchtime.